Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has declared a state of emergency, invoking certain emergency powers for the first time in the country's history over the weeks-long trucker protests against vaccine mandates that have been blocking three major border crossings between Canada and the U.S. Everything is on the table because this unlawful activity has to end. This is five days and it's already taking a toll of tens of millions of dollars. And while people have the right to protest, they don't have a right to illegally block the largest land border crossing in North America. But while those protesters have been fighting tooth and nail to avoid getting the vaccine, as is tennis great Novak Djokovic, who now says missing a few tournaments is a price he'd be willing to pay to avoid getting the shots, here in the U.S., many families are anxious to get their young children vaccinated. But despite predictions of a possible emergency approval of the Pfizer shot for kids five and under next month, the FDA is now saying they need more information to make their final decision, which the agency has pushed back to April at the earliest. So for young kids and their parents, it's more of the same. They're going to continue to have to remain vigilant if they're concerned about the risk of infection. Yeah. Still, many others are itching to get back to normal or something approaching it. And dozens of Republicans in Congress are calling on President Biden to officially rescind the federal public health emergency declaration, writing in a letter, according to NPR, quote, we call on your administration to do what so many states and other countries already have, except that COVID-19 is endemic. But that may not mean quite what some people think. I'm joined now by Dr. Cassandra Pierre, Medical Director of Public Health Programs at Boston Medical Center, and Dr. Jeremy Faust, an emergency physician at Brigham and, Brigham and Women's Hospital and instructor at Harvard Medical School. Thank you both for being here. Cassandra, two questions for you off the bat. Is it correct to say that COVID has now become endemic? And if so, what does that mean in terms of how our response to COVID should shift? It is not correct to say that here in the United States, at least, that COVID is endemic. COVID being endemic or the endemic state would imply that we have achieved a state in which COVID surges are predictable, potentially seasonal, and do not overwhelm our healthcare infrastructure and decimate our workforce. And as we can all attest to, we've lived to a period that has done just that. It is true that other countries um, have been able to experience with the relaxation of restrictions, um, less, um, le less upheavals in, uh, or surges in COVID-19 numbers. So um, when COVID-19 reaches endemicity or the endemic state in one area, doesn't necessarily mean that all areas sync up with that. And we are not in that state as, as of now. We are firmly in the pandemic. Jeremy Faust, the epidemiologist Christian Anderson coined a phrase on Twitter recently, endemic delusion. And he defined endemic delusion as follows. Uh, the delusional belief that the pandemic is over and that we can get back to 2019 life by suppressing the fact that we need to keep innovating and fight the virus. Best exemplified, he said, by Denmark. And then he went on to cite a whole bunch of COVID metrics, including deaths that are going in the wrong direction even though Denmark recently announced that COVID was no longer a threat to society. To your mind, is endemic delusion a problem here in the United States and elsewhere? It's certainly becoming one because if people have the mistaken belief that things are normal, then they will behave that way and they will soon understand the consequences of that. We just are in the tail end, I hope, of this Omicron wave which was nothing like normal, nothing like endemic. We have in this state, all cause excess mortality. That means more deaths than usual, not just COVID deaths, more deaths than usual. We, we know what's driving that, it's COVID. So to say that things are back to normal would imply that the usual rate of hospitalizations and the usual rate of death that any jurisdiction can predictably expect, which is something that we've been tracking for a century. Endemic implies that we're back to normal. And the numbers are very clear. We are nowhere near normal. And if we think we're normal and we act accordingly, then we will pay the consequence for that. I want to ask you about another tweet. You are the, the Twitter guest apparently today. This one is a tweet that you sent after a recent appearance on CNN in which you gently but firmly pushed back on the way they characterized your take on when you'll be ready to get your young child Vaccinated. I think we have an image of the tweet here. Basically, 
Uh, they had said that you will absolutely not vaccinate your child until it's proven that the vaccine works. And you amended that to say, I absolutely will vaccinate my child when proven that it works. I want to make sure that you have a chance to explain the difference between those two takes. I think I get it, but I, I want to make sure I'm right. What's, uh, what, what is your position right now on when you'll be comfortable getting your child a vaccine, when it's approved for them? Well, I'm really glad to talk about this because it's been an interesting few weeks. The, the FDA made the right decision and, and Pfizer made the right decision to not assess the data right now because, as I was saying, moving ahead with an authorization before we knew the dose that works for children under five was a very, very bad idea. And so that's what I meant when I said we would absolutely not do it because we want to know that the dose we're giving our daughter is safe, which we know it already is based on what they've shown us, but also effective. So my, my strong language was actually kind of levied at a policy from the FDA and Pfizer that I rigorously disagreed with. But I actually wrote again recently to say, you know, maybe I should have softened my language to, to reflect that tweet, to say, we will do it when. And I think so many parents want that. And in fact, we, we're going to have to do better than that, because for five and up, we have fantastic data to show that the vaccines are safe and efficacious but the uptake is very, very low. So if we're going to proceed with a vaccine for under five, we'd better have rock solid data that shows its benefit and its safety. I think we'll have that in the spring. I'm really optimistic, but I won't move forward without that. And I think a lot of parents would agree. I want to underscore a, a gentle correction that you just provided. I said at the outset that we were looking at uh, vaccine approval for kids five and under, that that was still pending. In fact, kids five and up can currently get it. So I want to stress that. Cassandra, you have young children as well. What has your family's approach been when it comes to, or what will your family's approach be when it comes to them getting vaccinated? So, um, you know, it's kind of boring when people agree, but in this case, I, I do agree that um, we should wait in general um, for the general public to have good scientific data on efficacy and safety for children under the age of five before going ahead with the approval or authorization of the vaccine in this age group. That being said, I chose a different tack. Um, I am a black woman with black children and we know that children of color have been um, disproportionately impacted compared to children of other races and ethnicities by COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, and even deaths. Um, so, uh, and I also have a child with an underlying health condition. Um, I've also been a participant uh, and am a participant in the, the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine trial. And so when an opportunity um, for my children to be enrolled right here at Boston Medical Center arose, I took it um, because I trusted safety. Um, and the question for me was about efficacy. Um, and so they are actually participants in the vaccine trial. Um, I've followed it every step of the way, even prior to their enrollment in the older age group. Um, and you know, the, the plan is, or the plan was, um, when we were um, at the point of where the vaccines were approved and we were unblinded, um, we intend or intended to get vaccinated um, if one of our children or both were not part of, were not picked to be uh, in, were not randomized to the vaccine arm. But that said, I felt it was important to, um, you know, as a privilege, honestly, get them involved in the study, but also increase representation of children of color. Um, in that, in that, in the trial data. I want to ask you both about what might happen when the vaccine is approved, assuming that it is for kids who are under five. Uptake so far in the youngest age group that can currently get it, the five to 11 age group, is not terrific here in Massachusetts. It's not that no one is getting the vaccine for their kids. I think 52% uh, of kids aged five to 11 have gotten at least one COVID vaccine dose. I should mention, by the way, my younger child is 11. She has received two doses and will get a booster as soon as that is recommended for that age group. Uh, but for 12 to 15 year old kids, it's 84%. And for all residents of the state, it's 87. So I'm wondering what you two think in terms of how eager parents of very young children will be to actually get the vaccine for them when it becomes available. Jeremy, why don't you go first and then we'll go to Cassandra. I think one thing that would help parents get to yes would be a better understanding of just how dangerous this virus is in comparison to other viruses that we routinely vaccinate against. 
there's this myth that it's just the flu or maybe the flu is worse. And if you look head to head, we don't actually have to guess. We have mandatory reporting for pediatric flu deaths. We have mandatory reporting for COVID deaths. We know what flu does year in and year out. We now know what COVID's doing to kids. Since September in the United States, we've had, uh, during the Delta period, I, I should say, we had 300 pediatric deaths in the United States from COVID-19. During flu season so far, we've had five. So the burden of disease is 60 times more mortality from COVID than influenza in, in pediatric populations. I think parents want to hear that. All the things they get, measles, mumps, rubella, all these vaccine, vaccinations that are routine or important, killed far fewer kids per year the year before those vaccines were rolled out, and COVID is killing now. That, that we would have this in, unusually high standard for COVID vaccination, I think, reflects the politics of the situation. But I think that parents will be moved in the right direction when they have the right context, which is that COVID-19 is a far more dangerous disease for children than anything else out there that we can vaccinate against. Cassandra, do you think that conveying the message Jeremy just described will make parents of young kids say, okay, yeah, let, let's get as many doses as we can? I think there are a couple of things. I think, yes, conveying the science will be, is critical. But I think that science is, is not the only message. And we've seen that prior uh, with prior older age groups in terms of messaging regarding science potentially not being enough. Um, and I want to underscore in the numbers that you just showed general numbers may obscure that there are even worse vaccination numbers in different subsets of the yes. population, including by race and ethnicity, right? So even here in Boston, we have a 30 to 40% gap in vaccinating children of color, Black and Latinx children, compared to other races and ethnicities. And that's a huge gap. And as I just mentioned, those are the children that are going to suffer the majority of complications for COVID-19 uh, relative to other kids in their age range. Um, and so when you when people have spoken to parents of color in the, in the past, in addition to wading through misinformation and disinformation and educating about science, the other issues that have come up have been access. And for many people in Massachusetts, we think we've handled access. We've put vaccines in retail pharmacies, in community embedded sites, we have mobile vaccination units. Um, that being said, we know that many parents are working parents and they don't have time necessarily to take time off to get their own preventive medicine or that healthcare visits or going um, to their children's pediatricians, which as we know are preferred um, trusted messenger for vaccinations for our children. So I do think that in addition to science messaging, um, dispelling misinformation and disinformation, it's critical that we also look to access, which may be defined a little bit differently than what we were defining it earlier in the course of the vaccine rollout. I want to close with a big question that we only have about a minute or a minute and a half to answer between the two of you. We have gotten through the Delta variant. We seem, Jeremy, as you said a moment ago, to be on the verge of here in Massachusetts getting through the Omicron variant. As we move ahead into whatever the next few months look like, should we collectively be bracing for perhaps later in the year, perhaps next year, another variant that will come and hit us and hit us hard and make us look for drastic mitigation measures once again. Jeremy, why don't you take first crack at this? We'll give Cassandra the last word. I think that variants, variants are inevitable. I think our response to them is going to become more nimble and more uh, tailor-made for each one. We're getting better at this. And I think each time it happens, we need to be willing to step it up. There's a lot of talk about de-escalation de of mitigation, and I, I won't get into that, but I will, what I will say is whatever happens, we need to be willing to put, think, put the heat back up on these measures quickly if needed. So if, we, if people decide to take off their mask, they have to understand the mask might have to come on in the future for a little while. If people are going about their business as usual for a little while, we have to say, look, in the future, you may have to stop that for just a little while. The idea is to do less as little as possible, but as much as needed. And I think that that's the right sizing that we now can do and we could not do before. I like that, Maxim. Cassandra, what do you think? Yeah, I could not agree more. I would also say, in addition to thinking about the inevitability um, and the fact that we now have reservoirs of COVID-19 in you know animal populations as well that might also transmit variants back to us, is that you know, something we've been saying from the beginning, um, global vaccination is really critical and key to really dampening the effect or the frequency at which we are seeing these variants. Um, there are countries in our own hemisphere, Haiti, where my family is from, with a vaccination rate, one dose received, 1.7% of the population. Wow. Um, and that is very concerning, um, both for that country, but also for the world. 
right, in terms of the ability to continue having ongoing spread and transmission of virus that leads to, um, you know, mutations and variants um, that could potentially threaten ours. And so it's important that we move both towards um, better global vaccine equity, but also, um, as my colleague just said, ensuring that there are benchmarks in place and that people are aware that they may have to go back into those mitigation measures when they uh, went in if they are dropped. All right, Cassandra Pierre, Jeremy Faust, thank you both for all of this. Appreciate it. Great to be here. Thanks. Thank you.